a pleasure to be here in my hometown of uh, Brighton. Um, I'm Kate Tarling and I work with large organisations, national governments, um, international institutions, um, big service industry companies, to help them to create the conditions for innovation, creativity and good design. And I would like to talk a little bit about this today. So if you search for um, how to design products and services that work for people, there are over, well over 2 billion references in Google now, um, and no doubt on through ChatGPT too. Um, so we are not short of advice and good practice for how to design things well, things that work well for people. Much of this advice, however, refers to sort of one team or one product or one service. Um, what if you have dozens or hundreds of teams working on all different parts of a product or a service, all different layers um, on different aspects of it? At that scale, there is no magic, simple process that will just apply as a standard to any team anywhere. But there are things inside an organization that help or hinder this work. So if you don't have the right conditions, if your organization isn't helpful and supportive in doing good design work, then you need to focus on creating that first or at least alongside. Um, in 2012, this team, a company called Peak Vision, they were bringing professional eye examinations um, to rural populations, so people well away from hospitals or clinics um, in low-income countries. And they were doing that by taking the great big clunky machinery that you would normally find in an eye clinic and putting those on mobile devices. Um, that meant that they could more easily access people, so the test could come to people where they were rather than asking people to come to a clinic. And there are criteria that have to um, be in place for these tests to be accurate. Uh, and this team was small, which meant that they could travel with the field staff doing these tests in people's homes to see for themselves what was working and what wasn't. So for example, they had said that the test has to be done at a three meter distance away from the participant. And then they saw that hardly anybody had a three meter distance inside their homes. So people couldn't meet that criteria. Because they had the skills with them, they were clinicians, they were developers, they could make the changes overnight and ready for the next round of testing. Um, and so they could see everything that got in the way of tests so that they could optimize how that thing worked. And that is a really great way of working. It's the way that we want, often we want to work, the way that we aspire to. But for larger organizations who do lots of different things, who've got hundreds of different teams doing this, it's just not that simple. And um, some of you might have seen this diagram. It, it shows the relationships and workflow that were in place before the coronavirus pandemic. So it's the pandemic response structures in the UK at the time. Um, now, it looks complicated, it looks messy, um, but this situation isn't unusual. Like, most large organisations will have their own version of a diagram like this. And our organisations were never intentionally designed to work in these ways. It's often the product of loads of different decisions, lots of different functions, governance boards being set up left, right and centre, people wanting to sort of weigh in or, or oversee things, um, often adding to this without taking much away. And that can take place over dozens, if not hundreds of years in some of our biggest institutions. And this is a pretty hard environment to do good product and service design in. So if in this case, the imperative is to get as many people vaccinated as humanly possible before winter. Like, just imagine waiting to convene the right people or how you're going to get everyone to agree to how it should be done in the first place. Like, it's just going to be really hard. Back in 2016, um, Hertz, the car hire organisation, started work on a new big website and a mobile app 
not just for the Hertz, but for many of the other brands that they look after too. After two years of working on this, millions of pounds were spent. They aborted the whole project. And they then brought a lawsuit against the systems integrator that had been involved after they said they had failed to deliver a functional website or mobile app in that time. Um, now, it's, it, some of you might remember this, sto this story. And it's, it's easy to sort of want to blame one or another organization, but it's more valuable to analyze, well, what, why? Like, what went wrong? And why weren't the problems much clearer? like clearer before those two years were up. Because like this situation should be unusual, but it isn't. It's not unusual in the private sector. It's not unusual in government either. Um, so it's good idea to kind of look at the reasons why. So if we look at this Hertz example, and if we say, well, you know, there's a choice of what we present to our customers and users. And in this case, it was a website and a mobile app. And that sounds kind of sensible. Um, but in terms of the design of that, for some reason, um, it wasn't designed to be responsive. There was a sort of very big version and a very small version that was created and not really much thinking about what happened in between. Um, so this, when this was called out, the supplier said, well, it's going to cost a lot more to make it fully responsive. Now, I'm curious why there wasn't any showing and testing of the work earlier on. Like, how was this not apparent before the end of those two years? If we look at the next layer down, so so much about our choices of technology and whether technology kind of helps and supports us to learn and iterate or whether it simply provides barriers and constraints to that. Um, in, in this case of Hertz, the supplier had opted to use technology and standards that were new to the Hertz environment. They didn't exist. And they were actually new to some of the team members involved. So that choice of using new technology that wasn't kind of well known or, or well and was kind of new to implement, like where did that decision get made? And was it made by a group that were familiar enough with the implications or the lack of success conditions there? And then finally, really, the problems go way back in the Hertz example to how the project was set up in the first place and how it was procured. So deciding to build an enormous website and a mobile app for multiple brands at the same time while expecting every single platform and product to be reusable across the whole thing in an environment that wasn't used to working in those ways is incredibly ambitious, if not really risky. So um, it was also split into lots of different work streams. So the supplier was responsible for some, Hertz themselves were responsible for others. So some were in the remit of one organization, some in the other. And that is silos, it caused dependencies. And it was decisions like the people responsible for writing all of the content for the website and the mobile app were completely separate to the people designing the website and the mobile app. So you have complexity, separation, and silos all over the place, and it's been set up that way right from the very start. So whatever the experience or otherwise of the people and the teams involved, there's a lot to learn from here. And it's a really common situation. Things happen upstream. They don't set us up very well to be able to be creative, to innovate, to design good things. And sometimes in large organizations, it feels like it's the turn of each big consultancy to come in, and yet none of them seem to resolve this situation. But it's us here, designers, researchers, product people, that have the lived experience of what it actually takes to make good products and services and to be able to continuously make them. And so if we don't have something to say about how to do this at scale, how to help our organizations out of that situation, then many other consultancies will, and they do, and the problems perpetuate. So this is big work. These are big challenges. So I just want to share four things that I think that we could do this week, no matter whether we are relatively new to the field, just working with our team, whether we are a really experienced contractor, whether we are a supplier ourselves, whether we are part of the leadership team. There are things that we can do about this. The first thing I want to talk about is how valuable it is to bring clarity into what are often really messy, chaotic environments. Um, and I'm sure many of us here will be really familiar with customer experience maps or service maps and so on. 
But if you're able to create a high level abstraction of what a service does that places the person who needs that service at the top, but still represents what that service exists to do, um, it gives you a framework to do many good things. And it's really different to the common way of thinking about something, which is to make a process map, which many more people inside organizations tend to be familiar with. Um, but that doesn't help people step back and see actually the whole performance of the whole thing overall and how well it works. So a framework like this allows you to do lots of good things, to talk about how well a service works, how well user needs are met, why on earth is it the top process so complicated when actually what's going on is pretty simple. And it does a great service to leadership who also find it quite difficult to see the wood for the trees sometimes. Get very clear on why services exist and why your organization has the particular services that it does. Um, that's a way of cutting through all of the noise and tangential directions and weird decisions that get made. So if you are new, you can help your team to work out the wider context in which the thing they're working on sits within. If you're more senior, then work with leadership on what are the most important services to bring those to light. And you start off high level with what is it, what's the context in which it sits? You can come up with a sort of neat description of what the service is there to do, and then say what a good outcome looks like for your average person using it. And that just helps to bring some clear rationale and a bit of sort of sanity across a really complicated environment. Um, to quote Lou Down, organizations often don't see their services um, or measure them for that matter. And what they do see or what they do measure are things like this. So um, really kind of high level abstract figures that you can't really take action on. Um, measures that show how we do things or how busy we are rather than whether all of the work we're doing leads to good outcomes. Um, so it's a lot of things like this, and that is why it's really valuable to bring in a perspective of looking at whole service performance because it's just more actionable. And that means thinking about this, so moving more from counting things towards the effectiveness or the efficacy of all of the work we do. Does it lead to the good outcomes or not? And that's really the basis of moving to whole service performance. So this work to change how organizations function, um, it can sound big, it can sound complicated, it can sound scary. And when something sounds big, complicated and scary, some people in your organization will switch off or find lots of reasons not to go there. Um, and they literally don't even need to do anything to avoid it. They can literally just keep doing whatever it is they're doing and nothing will change. So they don't actually need to do anything to sort of prevent the status quo from just staying in place. So our job is to make it easy. And uh, to quote Lisa Reichelt, make it really easy for people to do the right things. And that means not saying, oh, it depends all over the place, or not kind of wanging on about how complicated it is or how awful our organizations are at doing this stuff. It means breaking it down into something simple that we or our team can do this week or this month. Um, here's a really simple technique that you can bring to your team that's um, it was shared by Pete Gale, um, and it literally involves printing some content out, putting it in front of somebody, and they highlight the bits that made sense or didn't make sense. It's really simple, but it has quite profound implications. So it positions words as not just something that gets written and published, but as something that is meant to be doing a job, and it might do that job well or not, um, and that there are ways in which we can find that out. So it starts to seed the idea that we can learn about how well the things we're making work. Um, whatever le level you are at, it can be really interesting to just start sketching out the different decision making, um, where it happens, what kinds of decisions come up in your organization, um, what kind of boards or subgroups or working groups exist. What are they meant to do? You can follow a piece of work from somebody having an innovative idea 
to see, well, where does it go next? Is it that it's the managing director that says, yes, I agree, this is important? Is it that it goes to some funding or finance committee? Is it that it goes to some technical or design authority? Uh, or is it just a sort of a group of people? Like, how do these things take shape? Because at each stage, there will be a group of people influencing and potentially making helpful decisions or unhelpful decisions at every one of those. So just draw a messy picture. You probably won't know because nobody does have all the answers to how this is meant to look. But if you start showing it to people, they will bring sort of build in gaps um, and sort of bring it in. And you might end up with a hideously complicated diagram like the one we saw around the pandemic response structures, or it might be a bit simpler, but show it to other people. Um, many leadership will be horrified by how complicated it is to kind of get work moving through an organization. And it might inspire people to have some good discussions about, oh, hang on, isn't there a simpler, better way of doing this? Um, I used to think that, um, you know, as a UX designer, as a service designer, like if only leadership got what we were trying to do and how valuable it was, if they got that, then we could do our work. Whereas now I kind of think, ah, oh, like it is the work of design to help create the conditions for it in the first place. And this is a sort of model for how any time you come up with a barrier, a function that doesn't understand or that will block something, or that will ask you to say up front what it is exactly you're going to do. Like that's an interesting thing, kind of add that to the backlog of the work to be looked at, and then think of how can we do that differently? What's a good conversation I could have with somebody about that so that we could change it? You don't need to do all of this all at once, and you don't need to ask everyone else to do this all at once either. Um, break it down sequence things, make it simple, make it feel safe to do some of this work. There are always small, manageable steps that you can make along the way to pretty significant organisational change. So make your own version of this. You start somewhere. You learn by doing something small that feels safe to people. So maybe there's a new app or a new service you want to try. If you could just make it work for 10 people, you can probably do it with a person and a laptop and a phone line. Like That feels safe. You'll learn a lot about then how to scale it. So another thing that I think we can all do and that feels really true is changing the language to help change our organisations. Um, in 2023, there are still lots of people searching through policies and company documents to find all of the times where the word fax or a wet ink signature is mentioned <laughs> that stipulates how that service has to work. Last week, I spoke to people in the US government that are still doing this, and they were finding countless places where it still says, you must fax the document from here to here, and the fax shall be checked twice a day in case a new instruction has come in. So the words are, can dictate how our services work. And these often set really unhelpful constraints. Um, there's a HR department, and 15 years ago, a leader set a policy that each um, employee had to have a unique reference number, and that there was a process that had to take place to generate this. And it takes four weeks at that time. And now, 15 years later, so many processes have been built into that four-week time that now nobody gets their equipment on the t by the time that they start because this unique reference number hasn't yet been generated. And people are too scared to go back and try and unpick whether it's really necessary to do it in that way or not. So these can have some dramatic um, impacts, but they just can be unpicked. Um, Another way in which we can use words is to challenge or at least articulate some of the trade-offs that are inherent in services. So words can be used to set an imperative. So for example, somebody might say, safety is the only thing that matters. So if you work for a regulator or a part of government that is about control or standards or quality, um, now, safety might be really important, but often so too is the speed at which we carry things out. 
um, how we communicate with people what's happening, um, how long it might take if we stop a lorry to do a vehicle check, for example, or search a lorry for some reason. Keeping a country moving is also a goal of many organisations in that public sector or regulatory space. So to challenge that notion that this is the only thing that matters, we can use words to articulate those trade-offs and try to bring in a more balanced view and a way forward. Um, so the words we use also change the service, the culture of a service in particular. So do we treat people with suspicion, like they're out to defraud us? Um, or do we help people get everything that they're entitled to? Um, do we set the rules and people just have to like it or lump it? Or do we help people to do the right things? Because if we don't help people to do the right things or get what they should or so on, they will probably pick up the phone to us or it will cost the organisation more in terms of whatever compliance activity might be going on. So it's a real falsehood to imagine that doing things that work for users is entirely different to doing things that work for the organisation. They're really two sides of the same coin. And just a final one on words. Um, it's, it's, we can sometimes be guilty of this in terms of sort of user-centred design is really set up to work intentionally against the grain of the organisation. But, and so are other professions too. And in some cases that can lead to a sense of tribalism. So how can I help my organisation to see things the way that I see them? Um, and instead it can be more productive to just set up, actually, what are we all trying to work together to bring about? And it might be things like this, helping your organisation be more responsive to learn from users in real life contexts or helping leadership to be more informed about things as it makes decisions. Um, and rather the sort of that classic question from leadership might be, well, what will we get by when? We want to move our organisations more towards what do we need to learn? By when do we need to learn it? And what are the sort of barriers in the way of that learning? Um, and what's the sort of smaller, quicker thing we could do to learn what we need? Um, so finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about caring about what others care about. Um, when we're set up to be the only ones fighting for our customers and our users, it sets up us up as if we are against the rest of the organisation. But that isn't a great strategy to work together as a whole for the good of the whole. And it's a little bit like um, relationship counselling. There's a classic question, do you want to be right or do you want to be married? <laughs> uh, so do you want to be a tribe that sort of others folks? Or do you ideally want to be working together to deliver really good services? Um, this could be any large organisation, public sector, private sector, it doesn't really matter. They're historically organised into functions. And they are literally designed not to care about the other bits intentionally so that each function can specialise and focus on what it does best. So it's an organisation structure that's really common that is literally about silos, which is a problem if our products and our services deliberately transcend lots of different areas and entail working together. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to go around restructuring every single organisation we come across. There's always going to be boundaries and silos of some form or another. But instilling leadership principles and work to improve products and services that transcend, transcends them is really important. Um, so there are things that we can do, even if we kind of maintain the same structures. We just need to learn which boundaries help and which hinder. Um, and finally, kind of here's a way to think about that move from silos to services. And at every level, there are things that we can do about it. So it really is about emphasising the services that we provide to customers and users at the heart and re sort of framing what we do as supporting performance of those. And then all of the other bits of the organisation essentially become enablers or supporters towards that, bringing in their own perspectives. Um, and if we don't have something to say about this, the people and the companies and the suppliers that are less experienced with what it really takes to do this will. 
And so I think it's important that we have a view, that we have a position on it. And there are lots of really great people, teams and organisations doing this well. So we've got lots of work to share and learn from and celebrate. So I'm going to finish by saying be bold, be really ambitious, but just break it down into safe, comfortable steps and you can have huge impact in your organisations. Thank you.